Ladies and gentlemen, it's currently late March 2024, and Magnus Carlsen is no longer the world chess champion. Now, he is, kind of. He's the world champion in rapid chess and blitz chess, which are fast time controls. He's also the number one ranked player in the world, but he's not the world champion, you see, in classical chess. We got a little weird thing going on here. Uh, Magnus is not the world champion. Ding Li Ren won the world chess championship against Yan Yipo Mishi in the year 2023. And the interesting thing is, Magnus and Ding have not played a regular chess game against each other since Ding took Magnus's title. Until now. In today's video, I'm not just going to be sharing one game. I'm going to be sharing two games that Magnus and Ding played at the Grenke Chess Classic being held in Karlsruhe. That, I think that's how you pronounce it, in Germany. And also for being such amazing people and clicking on this video, I'm going to include another bonus game. So you didn't know that, but now you clicked and then here you are. Uh, you know, clickbait has multiple forms, but this one's going to be a positive one because I will be throwing one in like a buy one, get one free, except you don't have to buy anything. Uh, yeah, these two are playing what's called fast classical. Uh, classical chess is generally 90 minute chess or two hour chess. This is fast classical. <laughs> Just add a fast to anything, and that's what you're going to get. Uh, so they're playing 45-minute chess, which is pretty rare at the elite level. And they played two games against each other, and I'm going to show them to you. Magnus opens up with the Revenge Tour against Ding Li Ren by playing the move D4. I mean, Ding has his title. It must be really weird for these two to be sitting across each other, and Ding's like, I'm the world champ now because you didn't play. And Magnus is like, but I'm... You know what's funny? If you go to Magnus Carlsen's Twitter, like twitter.com forward slash Magnus Carlsen or however you would do it, uh, for like a year after his world championship, his banner said world chess champion. <laughs> he finally changed it to him and uh, Pep Guardiola. But uh, yeah, for a long time, it still said world chess champion. So this game opens with a completely standard Queen's Gambit. Uh, it did not exactly start as a queen's gambit. It started with these two moves, but knight f6 is a very popular choice. And then you make a decision on the second move. And it gets weird really early because Magnus doesn't play e3. He doesn't play knight c3. He actually takes the pawn on d5. And the reason for that is I think after knight c3, there are a lot of forcing lines for black, one of which being this move c5, which nowadays really kills all the fun. Uh, so Magnus takes on d5 himself, clarifies the structure. Now we're playing what's known as the exchange queen's gambit declined because you played a queen's gambit declined and then you exchanged pawns. Chess is not really rocket science or particularly all that difficult. We have knight c3 and now bishop f4. So not bishop to g5. Generally, this is the more active square for the bishop because it pins the knight to the queen, but both guys move their bishops out. And actually, if you look at not just the database, but you look at, you know, everything... Bishop f5 is a, is a perfectly reasonable move, but it has one small drawback. It's very, very, very minuscule, but this is the way Magnus Carlsen plays chess. Frequently by moves 7 and 8, he has taken both players out of their comfort zone. He's taken both players out of known theory. Uh, he doesn't play the main lines. And he does that on purpose. He does that to hit people with moves like knight to h4. You'll notice he's, he's above 45 minutes. That's not because he's a Time Lord hacker or Doctor Strange, uh, you get bonus time every time you make a move and he's not thinking. Basically, he kind of lulled Ding Li Ren into playing symmetrically and now he's gonna go after his bishop. Th this is the way he creates imbalances. So players at that level don't have an internal mental database that they can parse through. Ding plays bishop e4. You'll notice he does it after two minutes of thought. Bishop e4 is a provocation. You either want white to go here, which would in the future open up this, and actually is a losing mistake, uh, or you want white to play f3. And then the sides are having a silent debate. And that's really all chess is. I've said this before. Chess is simply a silent debate of who's the bigger idiot. You know, will white get an advancement here with the pawns, or is white weakening his king? Both things could be true. G4. Right, now both guys have started thinking. Ding plays bishop e7 and Magnus takes. He did in fact secure the bishop. Ding has a bunch of pawns on light squares and Magnus has a little bit of a, a space advantage. Now a very big question. Will Ding castle or will he try to castle the other way? If he castles short, 
Magnus's next move is pawn to h4. His next move after that is long castle, and then he's gonna go h5, and the gloves are off. Uh, the world champion, and the not world champion, but kind of still world champion, who didn't lose his title. He's still the world champion in two formats, and technically the world number one. He's just not the world champion, because the world champion is the guy who wins the classical world championship in chess. Even though you could win the classical world championship in chess by winning the rapid tiebreak of the classical world championship. But then you would... Oh, I think we might need a system overhaul in chess. Anyway, this doesn't happen, and instead of that, Ding, instead of castling long and getting into a fight, decides I'm gonna put my knight on e6, and I'm gonna make all the necessary preparations to castle that way. I'm gonna castle on the same side as Magnus so that we do not attack each other on opposite flanks. That was expertly done by Ding. I mean, honestly, his position was kind of passive and not massive, he rotates the knight to the middle, he tries to trade, tries to trade again, and this would just simply be bad for white. I mean, you're just allowing black to activate pieces. So Magnus goes bishop e1, and both guys castle. Now, Magnus still plays h4 because, well, actually the pawn was attacked three times, and there it's not. And now king b8. And now it's a really big question of, like, what is white gonna do? Well, he plays rook g1, okay? Uh, rook g1, both pawns are protected, so g4 and h4 both protected. Maybe you're gonna advance, maybe you'll play f4 in the future, uh, but it's still very, very, like, Ding just plays a6, and like I said, Ding doesn't have a light-squared bishop, he has six out of seven pawns on light squares, so his light squares have been weakened by the non-existence of a light-squared bishop, but he's very strong, and it, on the light squares, because he replaced a bunch of the pawns, and he's just, he's kinda gonna sit here. He's gonna be like, come and get me. And here, what the computer wants, what the computer wants, not what Magnus did, is to play bishop d3. Wants bishop d3. So that if black ever plays this move c5, you go g5, c takes d4, e takes d4. If knight takes d4, attacking the queen, both knights are hanging, so you can't quite do that. And after knight h5, you take on d5. So it's really difficult for black to play a move like c5 because g5 destabilizes the center. And if black just plays something like king here, the computer wants f4 and to go like this. Magnus plays rook g2. This move is mysterious. I guess it's trying to rotate over. Maybe it's trying to go here and push. Maybe it's, I, I'm not exactly sure. But Ding now doesn't wait anymore. He realizes that if Magnus himself can play the moves g5 or f4, he's gonna have a very good position. So he strikes, he doesn't allow Magnus to take advantage. And the second Magnus locks things up, he plays c5. It's a daring way for Ding to play. It really is, because Magnus is quite strong in the center, and you would think you're always taunt. The person with the two bishops wants the open position, so why would black open the position for white? Well, the truth is, the more moves that black makes that don't do anything, white is just going to very slowly, methodically, like, improve his position, play knight a4, and at some point make a breakthrough, like, either with his pawns or his knight or somebody. So Ding doesn't wait. He plays g5, c5. World champion, not world champion, world number one, doesn't really matter. Pawn takes c5, bishop takes c5, and now a big moment, and Magnus goes here. Losing the pawn in the center of his position. Choosing not to protect it, instead choosing queen b3 with an attack on the bishop, a pin on the pawn, a threat on the a6 pawn, and the opportunity to rotate the rook. So a lot of ideas here flowing in the white position. Ding plays the best move, pawn to d4, well-timed, anchoring in the bishop just disallowing white from targeting the center pawn and anchoring in that defensive piece. Knight c5 possible, knight d5 on the heels of that move. This knight will come to f4. The rooks can still double up and help. And uh, Magnus plays rook c2, queen d6. And I mean, I gotta tell you, visually, this does look very menacing. I mean, white has a lot of pieces. But here Ding plays a gangster move. And you gotta give respect where it's due. If Ding here played a move like rook c8, that loses. Because you take the rook, then you take the bishop, they can't take because of this. Okay, but that's simple, right? That's fair enough. So you can't, you know, what about rook d7? Then I would have went knight b6. So you can't go here or here. So you're going to go there? No, because then I still take the bishop. So what do you... Looks like you're just losing, right? No. No, the best move in this position, Ding Li Ren sacrifices. You guessed it. The rook. I'm not going to yell it because it's a defensive sacrifice, but he just gives up the rook completely. And he realizes something called relative value. His bishop is so good. And when Magnus has to give away his dark squared bishop, 
All he has to show at the end of this attack is a queenless position. Ding throws in the Zwischenzug. They're in Germany, of course. Right? You gotta throw in the Zwischenzug on the Autobahn while you eat some Bratwurst. Okay, I'm gonna stop. Uh, and now Black has a dark squared bishop and a very strong pawn. He has six pawns. And Magnus does have a very active position, but Black is so strong on these dark squares. You can't break through. In a position with no pawn mobility, which White does not have, he's not going to be doing very well. And all of a sudden, I mean, my man Ding, look at this anchorage, Alaska. Look at this position. He completely switched the complex. I mean, it was a position of light squared pawns. We go back to the opening, six out of seven pawns on the light squares. We go forward like 10, 15 moves. The whole thing changed. Ding's position morphs into a full dark squared blockade. Magnus keeps trying. Ding puts another pawn on a dark square. It's now, it went from 6 out of 7 light to 5 out of 6 dark. Fascinating. I mean, seriously, all of them on dark squares. 6 for 6. A full complex change. And guess what? Magnus has to sacrifice his rook back. He gives up the rook. And they go straight to an opposite colored bishop endgame, but this is simply a draw. The only way that white can win this is by winning that pawn and then promoting. And that's not going to happen because of bishop c1. So king c4, king c7, king d5, king d7. Very important, by the way, because now after you take this, I will take this, and then I will never lose either of my pawns. King e7, very well timed. Uh, important that bishop takes b2 actually does more harm than good, because after bishop f6, you lose, because I play h6. So you have to be very, very, very careful with these outside passers, but uh, Ding Li Ren is the world champion. And that is not, you know, that is not a reference to it. He just defends both his pawns. And if Magnus gives away his h-pawn, he will absolutely never accomplish anything. So instructive the way Ding did that. Completely, seamlessly, effortlessly ran his king. It was very important that he ran his king. Some of you may be wondering why he didn't go here. That's because he would lose the race. And I told you the only way to lose the game is to lose this pawn. And that is why Ding had to bring his king. Very accurate defensive technique. Put the king on the f8 square. Doesn't matter if your opponent's the best in the game player of all time. What a, what a game by Ding, and they drew. They drew a rook sacrifice, completely neutralizing Magnus's initiative. Yeah, very nice. I mean, that, 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 that's what we're talking about. And um, listen, like five years ago, Magnus did say that one of the biggest threats and only threats to him was, was Ding. And those were the days. Those were the days when 37 people watched chess and all of us sat in a dark room somewhere saying nobody should play this game. And now the entire world is playing, so thank you be for being a part of the chess world. I'm not saying that time was better, I'm just saying that's how it was. Like, 46 people watched the World Championship. Yeah. And there's like 198 countries or something? I mean, seriously. I'm kidding. But they played again. That I'm not kidding about. And this game, Magnus went for an opening called the Bozo Indian. It's called the Bogo Indian. But I really like to call it the Bozo Indian, because if you don't know what a Bozo is, great word. Most of you qualify for that status. Um, normally, in this move order, black plays d5. We just saw that. I don't know if you were paying attention, but same opening, right? Potentially. Uh, but if you don't go d5, you can play the Queen's Indian. You can also play the Benoni. You can play the, you know, the, the delayed Bond Cloud. Whatever you want to do. Bishop before the Bozo Indian. Uh, Ding Liren plays bishop d2, not the most common way to play, but you just trade the bishop. Also important to say, taking the bishop is not the most common way to play, like sometimes black defends the bishop. So Magnus decides to play it like this. Like I said, Magnus likes to take people out of their comfort zone. Ding playing in a relatively passive way. He's playing in a relatively uneventful fashion. And we have, a, we have another exchange, queen's pawn, and probably Ding expected ed. Knight c3, c5 maybe by Magnus, and putting the knights, and this is a very standard position. Magnus doesn't do that. C takes d5, he takes with the knight. That's interesting. So he wants the bishop open. He wants to move the knight out of the way, and then he wants the bishop to open up, because if he took with the pawn, he wouldn't have been able to get that. Knight c3. What Ding wants is he wants Magnus to take, so he could either take with the queen to apply pressure to this pawn and disallow it to move forward, I mean, even BC is interesting to have a strong center to play a4, a5 potentially, but queen c3 is better. So knight takes d5, knight c3, right? Knight d7. Okay, very interesting position. Maybe not to the untrained eye, but this is the position that we have. Both guys try to attack the other with a, a queen's pawn. 
And uh, rook c1, b4, a4, a5. This is what we're going for in this position. I think the rooks are going to pressure the queen side. The knight might jump to the center. The bishop will go to the f3 square. Something like that. Knight takes d5. Okay. Again, Magnus did all of this so his bishop would stay open. So this is obviously not the time he's going to take with the pawn and close his bishop. Not what he wants. Bishop takes. And now Ding plays b4. b4. The idea of b4 are very simple. Ding has three pawns on the queen side. Magnus also has three pawns on the queen side. So what he's going to do is he's going to play b5. And that is going to control the entire queen side. And basically then you will play a5. And these two pawns will make a lot of problems for black. Rook c1 with pressure, a6 with potential endgame problems. Then you will try to get a knight in there or there or like somewhere here and win the game. So b4, Magnus has to do something right now. He plays a5. And Magnus doesn't do that lightly. He doesn't really like to push pawns. He allows this, but he one of his pawns gets out, right? So this pawn is now under control. Magnus, I gotta get rid of that right away. He plays rook c8 and c5. Right away, he deals with the problem. He really didn't like that. Ding takes en passant, because it's forced. Rook takes c6. Rook c6. Bishop c6. Now it's a one on two. And really the question is, who's got the weaker pawns, right? Two on one, you would think is an advantage, because if you simplify it, you'll promote, but... I mean... I, we're far from that, okay? Rook c1, and now Magnus plays queen a8, going to the other side of the board. And Ding plays knight to e1 to transfer the knight over here and do, do a little damage, rook c8. Now, here the game could proceed for a little while. I mean, Ding could continue to ask questions and things like that, but this was the ninth round out of 10 in this tournament, and I think Ding lost the previous game. So, I think he kind of wanted a mental reset, so he offered a, an exchange. And that's going to get the bishops off the board, that's going to get the rooks off the board, and all in all, it will probably kill the winning chances. It happens, bishop takes, knight takes. Both guys make sure not to get back rank checkmated, showing the audience that it's good to you know, play like this. We have rook c6, but the game still finds a way to get spicy, because Magnus doesn't want it to end. Magnus doesn't want it to end like that. You know, for example, okay, let me just kind of very, you know, basic show you. Like, these pawns become very meaningful in the endgame. Uh, if you're not careful and you allow b4, you could be in for some serious trouble. I guess there is knight c3 here, so let's say king e1. But it's a, it's, you gotta be a little careful. So queen e7, f6, and now Ding's knight goes for a little walk, but Magnus gets in. And is targeting a lot of things. He's literally eyeing five things at the same time. Knight c6. Upon near Ding's king has fallen. Queen e8. Another pawn near Ding's king has fallen. But is Ding checkmating Magnus? What is going on over there? Queen g8 is mate. The game is over. Queen f4. A well-timed calculation. A smart calculation. And... The point is that if you play king g1 in this position, I'm going to take this. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you checks until the end of time. I'm going to play queen a1. I can take on a2. You're going to go over here. I'm going to give you this check. So by the time you're done, you're down a bunch of these pawns. And I got to keep checking you because the second I don't, it's like, mate, you're going to lose. So king h1 and the player shuffle. This one, unfortunately, not a whole lot going on. In this one, though... A tense battle for quite a long time, and one that ultimately ends in uh, uh, a draw as well. So, one tough fight, one a little bit boring, such as top-level chess. But I told you, for clicking on the video, I'm going to give you a bonus Magnus game. So, so far, the world champion has not managed to defeat the world champion of the other formats, and the guy that's number one. Chess is so weird. Magnus versus Richard Raport. Raport originally Hungarian, now representing Romania. C4, E6, by the way. Seeing this again, but this time instead of D5, we have C5. This is known as the Benoni. This is known as the Benoni. This is known as the Blumenfeld Gambit, but this is known as the Benoni. And what's funny about this game is that in the previous game, not against Raport, but just against another player, Carlsen played this opening. So Raport has a sense of humor and uh, he says, well, Magnus played this opening, so now I'm going to play this opening against Magnus. And they take g6. 
Magnus plays h3, very common move, covering the g4 square, and then plays e4. And in general, the ideas for black in this opening are an attack on the e-file, a flank attack with the f-pawn by moving the knight out of the way, uh, the counterplay on the queen side with a6, b5, b4, and every now and then you push the c-pawn. So Magnus plays bishop e3. The idea of bishop e3 is to play knight d2 and go over here and control this while also defending the center. But first you go here so that your bishop doesn't get blocked, and you go here so that this is not a move, which is why you had to play the move h3. So, everything makes sense. Bishop e3, knight d2, there's a6 trying to play b5, there's a4. And now in this position, Report plays something that might shock you. He takes on e4, which does not look possible, but it is, and I told you that black has counterplay here, black has counterplay with the f-pawn, and the idea is to sacrifice a knight and then put, play this move f5 to target this knight, to get the knight back. And if you go here, there's central counterplay, f4 is vicious. You do not want to lose that because this is losing for white. You don't want the dark squares this week, okay? So bishop e2, Magnus gives up the knight, says you could take it. I'm going to play knight c4, I'm a pawn down. It just gives away a pawn. But black can't play b5, right? So black plays a5. Which has been played before. The idea, he's switching the plan. He's now going to put the knight on b4 where it will live forever. It's going to be such a beautiful, useful piece. It's going to play an integral role in pressuring the white position. The knight on b4 is going to be really nice. Magnus doesn't castle, plays bishop f4. Bishop f4 has two ideas. One of them is to attack the pawn on d6. I bet you cannot guess the other idea of bishop to f4. You, you just simply can't. It's just not possible. You're not good enough. That's why you got to keep watching chess videos. Bishop f4 activates a piece without moving it. You ever play chess Jeopardy? That's what we're doing right now. Which piece is activated by bishop to f4? This one. Not that one. This one. Rook a3. Rook g3. Through the e3 square. So you open up the Schlagbaum, also a German word, and the rook is going to g3. I think it's a German word. Knight a6, castles, and as you can see, Magnus has very bad intentions for the black position. This rook is playing zero role in the game on a1, and over here, I mean, my god, it is useful. I mean, my, my goodness, it, that is a beautiful maneuver. And he's still doing this a pawn down, but black's pawns are hardly felt. I mean, black's pawns are no different than bricks in the wall. Shout out to Pink Floyd. Like, there is nothing here. But you, you know, you're gonna play rook a7, just like he did, and now you're gonna bring the rook over here and Magnus just plays h4. Wait, what? Isn't that just a free pawn? No, 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 no. No, it's not. First of all, there is this, which the queen used to protect. Second of all, bishop g5 almost traps the queen. There is this move and then it's chaos, but no. Uh, report plays rook f7. Magnus plays bishop g5. And here he does something which shocked me. He traded an attacking piece. Like, a move ago, this bishop is pressuring the anchor of the black position. The bishop on f8 sucks. It's on a home square. It, it shouldn't be traded. But Magnus breaks the rules. He says, you know what? I actually can trade that because what that does is it removes a king defender. And now h5. Who's going to guard the pawn? Not to mention the fact this pawn no longer has a guard. Not to mention the fact that when the queen went there, b6 lost the guard. Super low key. But let's not forget about that. Bishop f5. And now again, a move that removes a defensive piece. Bishop takes. Rook takes. Rook g7. Okay, Report is defending himself, but guess what? Report has too many weaknesses. The e4 pawn is a weakness for the whole game. The b6 pawn is completely weak. d6 falling would lose the game for black because the pawn would walk through. And the king side is weak. The king is weak generally. These are tangibly weak. And now g takes h5. And that move was the one that Black's position fell apart, but it was already very, very bad. Taking the bishop was the very bad mistake. Uh, report should have went g5, apparently, trying to seal the position a little bit. Tough move to play. Very ugly. Not very positional. So, rook g4, and Magnus just gets that. And he loses both rooks for the queen. 
but that's it. D6 falls and uh, Report's gonna win the pawn on D5. But look at look at this. Look at that. Look at that move. That is so vicious. Do you, do you get it? The knight is completely on its own. But queen to e8 is literally mate. It's just mate. Somehow the king, his rooks are like not protecting him at all in the right way. And this is a huge threat. And this is a huge threat. You can't stop both. H6, queen e6. You say, wait a minute. And by the way, that means that report resigned in this position. You say, why'd he resign? That's protected. I don't understand. Well, after king h7, the knight's going to come alive again. It's going to go right here. And it's threatening the rook. Queen's trying to get in there. Knight's trying to get... He just can't... He can't defend everything. You go rook a7. I play knight f6 and I win the rook. Uh, you go rook g6. I play queen f7. It's going to get even worse. What a game from Magnus. And can I just draw your attention to this guy? On the 20th... On the 17th move of the game, the knight went there. Can I tell you something else? On the 14th move of the game, this was move 14, report went a5. His mind was made up. His knight was going to b4. He was going to transfer the horse to the b4 square. He locked the position, and that's what he went for. And he resigned the game on move 32. 18 moves later, the knight did literally nothing. And it's very impressive. And actually, Magnus gave an interview after this game and literally said... In the Benoni, in this opening, it is quite frequent that the Black Knight wanders over there to that side of the board. Sometimes it's very useful. Sometimes you can put the Knight on d3. Like, for example, in this position, maybe you could try to get the Knight over here. But frequently, it gets lost in the position. And that fascinated me. That might not fascinate some of you because you might be a little bit beginner at chess or you're young so you're not you know you know you're like 13 so you're watching this like i don't care about the subtle detail but that is so crazy that in certain structures magnus can just know that that knight will just not be useful imagine just having that knowledge of chess just in this type of a position that knight just isn't useful fascinating anyway Magnus and Ding made two draws. Magnus is currently leading the Grenka Chess Classic, uh, and I will probably cover uh, the last uh, couple of days of it. And if you're watching this in March of 2024, the candidates begin in five days. So, candidates tournament to determine who will play against Ding Li Ren, the current defending world chess champion, in a match later this year. That's all I have for you today. Get out of here.